Thank you for joining us once again on today's broadcast. I'm Ramson Mumber, and I believe that the Word of God today will minister to you in such a profound way as we get back into the reality of redemption. You know, today we want to deal with the subject of identifying with Christ in life and in death. That is, in knowing what has taken place in this redemption that we have received from Jesus Christ. We not only have to realize that he became our substitute, but since he took our place, we must come to the place where we also now identify with him in life. That is, to get a hold of the things that he died to procure for us. And so as we get into the word of God today, let your faith be stirred up as you see the awesomeness and the vast profound accomplishments of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth as he did it on your behalf and on my behalf so we can come into the fullness of our inheritance. And I look forward to seeing you after the broadcast. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. Tonight, I will be taught the word of God. And I boldly confess that my mind is alert and my heart is receptive. And I will never be the same again because of the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living word of God. Therefore, I declare in the name of Jesus that this is my receiving day. This is my receiving day. And I expect a miracle today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Amen. Father, we thank you. We honor you. We came to glorify your precious name. It's so good just to be welcome in your presence and stand before you without fear, guilt, shame, or inferiority because we are washed in the blood of Jesus. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. I thank you, Lord, that I am anointed tonight to teach your word with simplicity and understanding. And I also thank you that these, your precious people, are equally anointed with an anointing of understanding and courage to hear and to do your word. For wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, Lord, tonight we choose to get wisdom. And in all of our getting, Amen. we get understanding. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen. The book of Galatians chapter 3, please. The book of Galatians chapter 3. Tonight I want to continue to build on the foundation that I started last uh, yesterday in discussing our redemption and what's involved in that. Because I realized that in this meeting, several things that will make your ears tingle will be spoken. And unless you have a biblical foundation to anchor your faith, you might feel like some of the things being declared over you are too good to be true. So the Lord spoke to me with regard to my sessions that I should go back into his plan of redemption to bring you an assurance of faith that causes you to understand I'm not trying to force God to do this on my behalf. He wants you to understand that he took the initiative and of his own volition he came and presented a covenant to you and all you have to do to begin with is to receive it by faith and then the door is open to your inheritance. If you understand that, say amen. amen. Now in the book of Galatians here, chapter 3, uh, please notice the 13th verse. The scripture says, Christ has redeemed us. Notice he is not going to redeem us. We are already redeemed. He's redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Underline that preposition, for. He's been made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree. Obviously, the apostle Paul quoting Deuteronomy 21, 21, and 22. And he says, everyone that hung on the tree had a curse on them. 
And, it, and then he gives you the purpose that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And I know as we attack this thing in tandem as a company of pastors and preachers and, 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 and men and women of God declaring the word of God to you, I know that there will be so much taught you from this pulpit this week concerning your part in the blessing. But I want to dwell on verse 13. I want to dwell in the realm of your redemption. So yesterday we began to look at redemption and we said, as we begin to study God's plan of redemption, it is important for you to realize that it is the testimony of the scripture that God is both the initiator and the administrator of the covenant. So contrary to what some people without courage would have you believe or pass a judgment on you because they think because you're believing God for these things, you must be greedy or covetous, and we will define covetous. Covetousness is when you think the, your life actually depends on the abundance of your possession. But, but now notice this. We want to get to the place where we realize this is God's initiative. Because here is the thing. The world, and we will see this in our next session, the world wants to define you so they can confine you. For whatever you define, you can control. And they want to control you by assigning you a place. They, they want to tell you, this is what God's people can have, and Christians ought to not have this, and they've never even read the Bible. But they have an opinion about what you ought to walk in. Can I get a witness in the house? And so we, what we want to do is be able to have a reason for the hope that we profess. You remember Peter saying that. We must be able to give an apology, and, and, and apologetics is not, it's not like uh, saying you're sorry. Apologetics is a study of theology that lets you know about the defense of the gospel. But he wants you to be able to defend the gospel intelligently. Yeah. And that's the purpose of this, uh, this session tonight. So we said to redeem means to buy back means to buy back something that was lost or stolen. It means to lose from a bond. It means to set free from captivity or slavery. To redeem means to exchange something in one's possession for something possessed by another. It means to ransom by paying a debt off. So when we talk about your redemption, we are saying you've been bought back from the curse of the law. And you're going to find out tonight because there are several things that we will grapple with. We, we, we're not just going to deal with the surface issues because if you don't understand your redemption, you will perhaps give more credibility to the devil and his sources. But the truth of the matter was, is that in redemption, uh, God did not even pay the devil. Because when Adam fell, and we will deal with this, it wasn't the devil's holiness that was offended. God killed himself and paid himself so you can be free. And just like if it was dark in here and we turn on the lights, there is no debate from the darkness. The darkness just leaves because the light is always stronger than darkness. Just like healing is stronger than sickness and the blessing stronger than the curse and truth mightier than error. Hello, somebody. So we're going to find out where we stand and then you won't have to be insecure in your covenants. We talked about redemption. Having come from the three Hebrew words that are used to define this legal transaction. The first one being pedar and it's a substitutionary sacrifice. That Jesus Christ stood in your place. That's where the theology of pain automatically gets invalidated. Why? Because if Jesus Christ became a curse for us, that means I can never be a curse. For if he became sick 
for me, like Isaiah 53 and verse 10 says, God made him sick in the Amplified Version. That means I was born healed. I have no sicknesses of my own. So whenever sickness and disease shows up, it's somebody else's sickness. Mine has already been taken care of became, because it became a curse. What? For us. Can you say amen? amen? And so Jesus Christ is our substitute. The second word we looked at was the word Gael, which means to buy back one's freedom by acting as a kinsman redeemer. We talked about the fact that throughout scripture, God always uses a kinsman to redeem somebody, somebody that identifies with you. And tonight, that's the route I'm going to go. I'm going to talk about identifying with Christ both in life and death. Identifying with Christ both in his death and his life. And, and most Christians have never even completely understood their identification with him in death. And don't worry, we'll define all these terms. Uh, so so they, they, they are still buying all kinds of erroneous things just because of a lack of understanding. And the scripture says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But part of that redemption package means we now have a brother. And the scripture says that he that sanctifies and them that are sanctified, you remember Hebrews chapter 2, he partook of flesh and blood. And therefore, notice, he's not ashamed to call them his brothers. So Jesus Christ became a man. Chapter 4, he goes on to tell you, we have a priest that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Why? Because in that he was himself tempted in all points, yet without sin. So now we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Hello, somebody. Why? Because we got somebody that identifies with us. In the incarnation of Christ, that is in his act of assuming flesh. When, he, when the word was made flesh, Jesus Christ identified with our humanity. Now my assignment today is if he identified with our humanity, it is now our job to identify with his deity. I'm, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. B because if he became a man and he took my place, then the, it begs the question, what have I become? Oh, you're going to see this tonight. But let's, let's just build a little bit. The third word we said was the word Kippur, from which we get Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And just in parenthesis, the blood of Jesus is not atoning blood. It is remitting blood. Because to atone means to cover. And the blood of goats and, and bulls and animals in the Old Testament could not remit the sin. That's why you study the book of Hebrews. It tells you every day the priest had to repeat the same sacrifice because the blood was only enough to cover the sins for a year. If it went beyond a year, again the stench of sin would come up and judgment would be in the camp. But the Bible says when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead as a faithful high priest, he entered the heavenly holy of holies and he presented his own blood on the heavenly mercy seat. Glory to God. I'm going to come down. But notice this. Uh, Jesus Christ is, is your Passover lamb. El Shaddai International Christian Center London is a community of people who are passionate about sharing the love, hope, goodness, and purpose of God to our generation. The El Shaddai, I see, is a prophetic church. It's a church with healing in their wings. It's a church that just don't know how to worship, but knows how to take free the word of God to a generation. It's a church that is vested and founded on revelation knowledge. It's a church that will prophesy life to a dying world. We are a multicultural church with over a thousand members from more than 55 different nations. Our meetings are family oriented with vibrant, extravagant worship and inspiring practical teaching from God's word. It would be our pleasure to welcome you to this family, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, I don't care what's happening in the world. Just like on the night of Passover in Egypt when they were dying, the death angel could not come to their house. I don't care what's happening in the present day Egypt. You got a Passover lamb at your house, and his name is Jesus. Therefore, sickness has to pass you by. The recession can't touch you. Hello, somebody. This is the way we're going to deal with this. And as you begin to see this, it really causes you to understand your emancipation. So now, knowing that Jesus Christ became a curse for us, 
we must realize that there are several things that we must understand. We have to deal with why was it necessary for him to die on the cross? And why is it that God could not just kill the devil? And that's the same question you've been wondering, and we're going to answer that. We will answer why you must believe in the immaculate conception. If you don't believe in the virgin birth, you are not saved completely because there is no other blood type that could satisfy the wrath of God except the very blood of God running through the veins of a man. For when Adam sinned, the scripture says he was the son of God. You remember the book of Luke chapter 3. I'm just, there's so many scriptures, so uh, at the moment I'm building and, and, and every so often in our, in our church, I expect them to know the word. So I use phrases like, you remember, and then when I look at them and they're looking blank, we have to look at it. So please inspire a little bit more confidence in me when I say, you remember Luke chapter 3, don't look like, huh? <laughs> Is the Pope Catholic? You know, <laughs> I don't know what I remember. <laughs> but you remember the book of Luke chapter 3, giving the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the pedigree of Jesus Christ. It goes through all the generations of Jesus Christ and it gets down to Adam and it says, Adam who was the son of God. Adam did not have a natural father. That's why when Adam sinned and because God sees the human race as a complete organic whole, all of us were in the loins of Adam, and that is a Bible principle. You, you can see it even with regards to tithing. He says, he says, those of you that want to argue about tithing, is it Old Testament or New Testament, let's talk about Abraham, hello somebody, and, and, and how he tithed to Melchizedek, and the Levites who received tithes later on, who were in the loins of Abraham, hello somebody, were paying tithes, even though later on by the Levitical priesthood and the order of Aaron, they were exempt from that. So you can't say tithing is of the Old Testament because the guy who received the Old Testament in the, in the Old Testament later on, and he, he, before he was born, he already tithed in, in, in Abraham. I'm going to calm down because I can see some of you looking at me like, is this? We, we will see this. So now, it is the order of God that God sees mankind as an organic whole. So when Adam fell in the garden, we all fell. God said it's not good for man to be alone. And then all of us that came out of the loins of Adam inherited Adam's guilt and inherited the corrupt nature. We inherited so much of the fall to the point where I meet people who always argue, well, I don't believe in universal sin. I don't believe in the fall of man because that sounds so unfair. Well, the evidence of the fact that you and I, because here is the deal, the only thing you need to do to be a sinner is to be born. Somebody said, well, that sounds too harsh. No, 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 no. Uh, that's the Bible. <laughs> you, know, you know why? This is what gets me about people that want to make the gospel attractive by watering it down. They, their conviction is that if we package God better, the world will receive him. But, but that's not the testimony of the scripture. The Bible already says that the gospel is offensive. You know why the gospel is an offense? Because in its simplicity, the gospel is simply this. You're wrong, God's right, now you change your mind. <laughs> well, but I'm educated. He says, no, no, you're wrong, I'm right, you change your mind. And th this is what really gets you. It is not God who needs to be made acceptable to us. So that's why we don't repackage God. Mankind is the one that needs to be acceptable to God. That's why mankind has to repent to change his mind before he can enter the kingdom of God. But if you don't understand this, you will think that if we don't talk so much about righteousness and living right and, and tell people what the scripture says, maybe they will love God. No, a sinner is dead in their trespasses. And it takes the grace of God to command the same light that is spoke to shine in darkness to shine in their hearts. You remember 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If our gospel is hidden, and verse 4, it is hidden in those that the God of this world has blinded, not their eyes, their minds. There's something worse than having no physical sight. It's called a blind mind. 
And we're living in a generation of blind-minded people. Romans 1 calls it a reprobate mind. A mind that thinks right is wrong and wrong is right. And you will even defend it with your life. Because you just can't see how it can be that you must be born again. Some people would rather die than really accept the fact that man is in a fallen condition. The theology that tells you that man is essentially good is wrong. I'm going to slow it down. No, man isn't essentially good. Why? Man gets born with a fallen nature. That's why you never have to teach your kids to lie. Right there at two years old, they know how to manipulate you. You, you, you never took them to a class. Now, this is how you get more sweets out of mommy and dad. Hello, somebody. <laughs> they just know because it is born. You see, most of us think sin is just because of commission and omission, the things that we do and the things that we don't. And sin is missing the mark. Yes, that's a practical definition of sin. But let me give you something to think about. Sin is any failure to conform to the moral law of God in action, in attitude, or even by your nature. Notice in action, in your attitude, and in your nature. Well, I wasn't born a sinner. He gives you how you can find out. He said sin came into the world, Romans chapter 5 and 12, and death by sin. In other words, if you're going to die one day, it proves that you have got sin in you. L let, let, me, let me back up a little bit and explain this. You remember when the passion of the Christ came out? Some folks said, who killed Jesus? Nobody killed him. He said, I have received commandment. You remember that John chapter 10? From the Father. And he has given me the power to lay it down and to pick it up again. When they came to arrest him, they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. And they fell back. They stumbled back and fell. They couldn't kill him. Why? Because you can't kill a man who hasn't sinned. They, they tried that so many times. At Nazareth, when he preached, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. They said, this is the son of Joseph. He's becoming a legend in his own eyes. And you know, Nazareth is a city that was built on a cliff. Uh, so they, they took him to cast him headlong off the cliff. And the Bible says, while they were fixing to cast him headlong off the cliff, he just walked through them. What changed? You can't kill a man who hasn't sinned. Bible says on the cross, they had crucified him. And he stayed there so long, so alive, that the centurion had to say, surely this must have been the son of God. And then he says, and then the Bible says, and he yielded up the ghost. He gave up the ghost. Otherwise, Jesus could still be on the cross today alive. Uh. <laughs> see, see, then, then some of you say, well, he could have died because God made him to be seen. He was seen for us. Oh, you're going to see this. This is, the, this is the mystery of redemption. When Jesus was on the cross, you remember Moses in the Old Testament, he represented him as a serpent on a stick. Why would you represent the Lamb of God as a serpent, which equals the devil? Oh, my goodness. And yet Peter said... That when he died on the cross, 1 Peter chapter 2, he was the sinless, spotless son of God. But Moses saw him as a serpent, a sign of an abhorrent thing to God. How come that happened? Because God made him to be sin for us. But Jesus Christ in himself, the scripture says, he knew no sin. God painted your sin and my sin on him, but the essence of who he was, he still had to be blameless. Okay, okay, shall we use Old Testament shadows and types? You remember Moses said to them, you must bring a lamb without spot or blemish and kill that lamb. So, so if Jesus had gotten to the place of sacrifice and had been tainted by sin, he would not have become, he would not have met God's criteria. But 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him to be seen. You know, What? For us, hello somebody, that we might be made the righteousness of God. So God made him to be seen, but he, even on the cross, he was still untouched by sin. Oh, this is awesome. 
See, when you begin to examine this, that, that's why if you, if you don't pay attention to the nuances, because most theologians understand that the, the key to understanding the Pauline letters, the letters that Paul wrote, is in the prepositions. I'm so glad you could join us for today's broadcast. My prayer is that the Word of God has ministered to you today and made a mark in your life that can never be erased. Let me pray for you today because my greatest desire, the reason that we broadcast these messages, is that we can make a difference and help you connect to the fullness of your destiny in Christ Jesus. So Father, today I pray in the name of Jesus for our television audience, I speak the blessing of God. I release the wisdom of God. I decree the favor of God. Open doors that no man can shut. Thank you for fighting their battles and for those that are discouraged. I pray that hope will begin to rise up again and they will know that one of these days as they pursue you, they will experience and see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad you could join us today. So until next time, it's Ramson Mumba reminding you that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, you get wisdom and in all of your getting, get understanding. God bless you. El Shaddai International Christian Center London is a community of people who are passionate about sharing the love, hope, goodness, and purpose of God to our generation. The El Shaddai I see is a prophetic church. It's a church with healing in their wings. It's a church that just don't know how to worship, but knows how to take free the word of God to a generation. It's a church that is vested and founded on revelation knowledge. It's a church that will prophesy life to a dying world. We are a multicultural church with over a thousand members from more than 55 different nations. Our meetings are family oriented with vibrant, extravagant worship and inspiring practical teaching from God's word. It would be our pleasure to welcome you to this family, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you for watching Get Understanding. For information about our ministries or to download our free podcasts, visit us at www.elshaddaitoday.com.